Um, we are uh, going to continue with, this is our final study, this is going to be the last of my presentations, and uh, A lot of time we want to do a word prayer so we can start that. how each reformatory movement has prefigured ours, we are better equipped to discern and recognize the way God has worked throughout history, how he has led in the past, what have been the tests that God's people have been required to go through, and in this fashion, we are uh, better prepared to follow the lamp with the sword of the Lord. So, just as a quick summary, the way in which the three messages come into our history under the Revelation 18 angel, we mentioned that because the third angel was never in power in Millerite history, and afterwards God's people went into a Laodicean condition of spiritual lukewarmness, it was necessary that these messages will have to return. And before we can proclaim or be part of the proclamation of the third angel's message, we ourselves have to go through this process. We have to receive and experience the first, the second, angels before we can proclaim the third, because they always come in the order. And these angels symbolize the work of God's people. Each of these angels, they symbolize a particular work God is giving to his people. And we mentioned 1989 was the arrival of the first angel, the perfect fulfillment of the first angel in our history. And this message, which was Daniel 11, 40 to 45, and the premise that Millerite history was going to be repeated in our history, was empowered in, on September 11, 2001. This is marking both the arrival of, I mean, the empowerment of the first angel as well as the arrival of the second. And you can see that when you read carefully Revelation 18.1, pointing to the empowerment of the first angel. Revelation 18.2 is repeating the second angel. So this is, the two angels are blending here. So now, we are under, in this history, you're going to be under this combining message and the second angel that arrived in 9-11 is going to be empowered at the midnight cry. And the, um, the, midnight, the second angel is going to be empowered 
and simultaneously you're going to have the arrival of the third angel that is going to be in power at the Sunday law. So this is the, the logical sequence and this is the work of combining the messages. So now what we want to do next is to look at the every mention in the Bible of the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month because this these way marks we learn from the experience of Ezra and we already saw how Ezra was to define Millerite history he began to come out of Babylon first day of the first month and in Millerite history there was a call of Babylon on April 19, 1844. And four months later, on the first day of the fifth month, Ezra was arriving to Jerusalem and he was carrying a decree within his hand. And this corresponds with August 11, 1844, when, I'm sorry, August 15, 1844, when the Exeter camp meeting, during the Exeter camp meeting, the message was, uh, was empowered. And the Midnight Cry was empowered in that history when Samuel Snow was able to convey uh, the logic for identifying the closing of the door in their history. And um, these waymarks of the history of Ezra 7 9, we also see them repeated in our history. We have on September 11, 2001, we have the first day of the first month. And when the midnight cry arrives in our history, is going to be fulfilling the first day of the fifth month. And next, the tenth day of the seventh month, this is the tenth day of the seventh month, is the perfect fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. Because this is when the sanctuary is going to be cleansed and no more sinners will uh, walk inside. This is when the church triumphant will be uh, form and so now we're going to see these references in the Bible. We go to we turn to Ezra 10 verse 16 and 17. This is one mention of the first day of the first month. We read and the children of the captivity did so and Ezra the priest with certain chief of the fathers after the house of their fathers and all of them by their names were separated and sat down in the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter. What he's telling us when you read the context of this history is that Ezra's attention was called to the fact that God's people that have arrived in Jerusalem they, they found that there, there was a problem because God's people had mingled with the inhabitants of the land and uh, of other nations. And they had taken strange wives and married them. So they made a, an agreement that they were going to take or a covenant, but they were going to put away the strange wives. And we read in verse 17, and they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month. So, first day of the first month marks when the strange wives are going to be, to be put away. Millerite history, this is marking a separation. Wife in Bible, it's a Bible symbol for church, for doctrines, because doctrine is what makes a church. It's what makes this a church distinct. So this is pointing to on April 19, 1844, the separation that took place between the Millerites and the Protestants. They were leaving behind the churches that they belonged to. 
and they were separating from uh, their communion and their false teachings. So in this history, in Millerite history, the fulfillment that took place is uh, separation from Protestantism. And you're going to see in page 139 of your notes, there is a table there where you have sort of a summary. And uh, this strange wife in April 19, this was separation from Protestantism. Uh, now, the first day of the first month is also 9-11. So what will it mean, separation of strange wives for us in 9-11? This means that we are called it, to enter into covenant with God. We are to put away any false doctrine. And it has been already addressed that the sin of God's people at the end of the world is that they are... Uh, is the false doctrines that are being introduced among God's people. This is the sin that we need to repent of. We need to repent of the sins of our forefathers, which they did the exact same thing. So, we are to separate ourselves from false teachings, false doctrines, false teachers, and churches where error is being taught. Or where there are... Uh, where they are adverse to the present truth. So this is what is marking for us. It's separation from any false doctrine that has been introduced in Adventism. Um, next reference to first day of the first month, we find in Ezekiel chapter 29, verses 17 through 21. This is addressing um, the wages for the king of the north. We read Ezekiel 29, 17. And it came to pass in the seventh and twentieth year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder was peeled. Yet, had, yet had he no wages for his, nor his army, for Tyrus, for the service that he had served against it. Therefore, thus said the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And he shall take her multitude, and take her spoil, and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor, wherewith he served against it, because they brought for me, said the Lord God. In that day I will cause the horn of the house of Israel to bud forth, and I will give thee the opening of the mouth in the midst of them and they shall know that I am the Lord. So there's, there's a lot of information in those verses, but it's pointing to, in this history of April 19, 1844, this first day of the first month, it's pointing us to the fact that the king of the north, Nebuchadnezzar, which is a title in this history of the papacy, who had Brought, had, had worked for God during the 1260 years. Because we understand that God's people, after being rebellious to the covenant, they had been already forewarned that they will have to go through in serving under servitude through hid, to hidden nations. And one of these nations is symbolized by Rome. And Rome was going to do that work because God's people were not willing. He originally had placed them on the land of Canaan where they had every advantage. They had prosperity. They had every 
every means to fulfill their mission, but they wouldn't serve God and they wouldn't obey His covenant. Therefore, the lessons they wouldn't learn in freedom, they will have to learn under the servitude of these pagan nations. And so the papacy was part of this, uh, this work that was being accomplished, even though it was a satanic work, but it was accomplished, it was it accomplished a purpose for God. And it came to an end in 1798, and <coughs> God is saying he had not given a wage, wages to the papacy for his work. So it's promised him, it's promising a nation is going to give him Egypt. And we know in Bible prophecy that, for instance, in Revelation 13, two beasts are mentioned, one that comes out of the sea and one that comes out of the earth. And the one that comes out of the sea is the papacy which receives its deadly wound, 1798. So it's forgotten. Simultaneously, the beast that is ascending now is the United States of America. And this nation, under this nation, with the separation of church and state, is going to provide the platform for this mighty movement to come into history. And so, this nation was the inheritance or the inheritors of the Protestant Reformation. So it was their privilege to continue advancing into clear light. But they were, they became Laodiceans, so to speak. They became content with the light already possessed. And they have not come all the way out of Babylon. They carried some papal errors. So therefore, in this history, they began to, uh, to look back to the papacy, where they to return it away, because they were in their doctrines, they were still holding on to Sunday sacredness, they were holding to the immortality of the soul, they were carrying papal errors that they could have been uh, purified, the Protestant churches, had they been faithful. So, in we are told, if, if you turn in your notes, I think I have, yes, a, a quote in page 141. Um, this is from the Great Controversy, page 436, under the heading Republicanism and Protestantism. It says, he, and he had two forms like a lamb. The lamb-like horns indicate youth, innocence and, innocence, and gentleness, fitly representing the character of the United States, when presented to the prophet as coming out in 1798. Among the Christian exiles who first fled to America and sought an asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance were many who determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. Republicanism, which is the political power and Protestantism, which is the religious power, became the fundamental principles of the nation. These principles are the secret of its power and its prosperity. And we know that they can be separate. That was the principle of the Constitution, uh, the strength of their Constitution. And uh, so these two horns, at the beginning, the Protestantism possessed is Republicanism and Protestantism. And we are told in, well, these principles, they're going to start compromising them because what happened here, as the Protestant churches were confronted with the everlasting gospel, this was the opportunity for the Protestant churches to be healed, to come out completely out of Babylon or Rome, Christ, or from the papacy, darkness that they were still holding on to. But because they rejected this message, 
they end up joining once again Babylon. And that took place on April 19, 1844. The Protestant horn, one of the, the first horn of the two, is going to be conquered. This is Protestantism. The religious component of the United States is going to be conquered when Protestantism is declared as fallen. So, Sister White is going to tell us something here that is relevant. In Great Controversy 389 is the same bottom of the page 141 of your notes. It says, The second angel's message of Revelation 14 was first preached in the summer of 1844. And it then had a more direct application to the churches of the United States, where the warning of the judgment had been most widely proclaimed and most generally rejected, and where the declension in the churches had been most rapid. But the, the message of the second angel did not reach its complete fulfillment in 1844. The churches then experienced a moral fall in consequence of the refusal of the light of the Advent message, but that fall was not complete. So he's pointing to the fact that when Protestantism was conquered, a moral fall took place. The moral fall was Protestantism. They were joining now the fallen church of the papacy. So this is what is marking in April 19 is God is going to promise to the promising to the to the papacy to give uh, the United States of America. And you have to remember that United States of America, even though in Bible prophecy is identified as the false prophet, he is also one of the ten kings. The ten kings are the civil nations, the governors and rulers of this world, the civil powers, civil and political powers, and the United States is uh, represented one of them. If I, if I understand correctly, it's represented by Ahab, right? Who was the king of ten, uh, the ten tribes, and he was uh, in bed with uh, Jezebel, which is a symbol of the papacy. So, the United States is one of ten kings, and is the ten kings represent Egypt. So, the, it's the United States which is going to play a role at the end of the world to to seduce the other kings of the world to to make the image to the beast and to impose on the law. So. Here in April 1944, it's uh, if this is the Protestantism was conquered. And that was the form of Protestantism. In our history, first day of the first month, September 11, 2001. What took place here is the conquering of the second form of the United States, which is the political form, which is re trust its republicans. And this was accomplished through the passing of the Patriot Act, which is Oper operates, it's, a, it's marking a change in uh, the judicial approach because formerly the United States was operating under English law, which means that a person is considered innocent until it's proven to be uh, guilty. But on 9 11, they're going to switch to Roman law. In, on the Roman law, a person that is convicted is considered to be guilty unless it is proven to be innocent. So it's the opposite. And this is taking place here. 
And this is marking that the United States, its political component, is already conquered. The government is already influenced. And the Sunday law could have been implemented shortly after, have not Islam come into the picture and create a distraction. Because now, what is happening is that instead of the papacy being focused in identify and destroying God's people, now both the papacy and the kingdoms of the world, the civil powers, they are focused on implementing resources and technology and everything that they have to try to restrain Islam. Because Islam is really a threat to the governments of the world. So this is what is uh, it's keeping them busy. It's buying for us time so that we can receive the oil during this history. But technically, the, this everything is set in place for uh, the, the United States is already under the grasp of the pigs. And it's going to fall completely at the summit law. When, uh, <clears throat> so, the, so this is the Republicanism. But the verse doesn't end there. We read that that day also, verse 21 of Ezekiel 29, it says, In that day I will cause the horn of the house of Israel to back forth. And what is what causes the to bat the body forth? It is the rain. So it's marking that God would cause another horn, the horn of the house of Israel, to back forth because of the rain that is going to start sprinkling. And also, I believe, if during this history, this second angel was marking a moral fall that took place, who was falling morally at this time? The Protestant churches. So when this second message comes in our history and arrives, and it is being proclaimed, or it is being arrived here at 9-11, would you expect to see a moral fall taking place here also? So a moral fall has to take place here. But what moral fall is identified in this verse? Is it Protestantism that is falling morally here? It's actually Adventism. It is marking a rejection of the message for the hour. So this is this is marking for us spiritual formation, as all of you know already, was implemented right in September of 2001. And as it has been already mentioned, spiritual formation is not other but spiritualism. It's a counterfeit of a revival. It's a counterfeit of the power of God, but this is coming from Satan. So this is marking for us a moral fall. A rejection of a message, they're not going to receive uh, the message from God, they're going to go to the witch of anger at this time. And uh, so we have now come to the next reference, and I think I need to, I need to start hurrying. Uh, Genesis 8.13. Genesis 8.13. Our next reference. Uh, the waters are going to dry up. To my also here in Morocco. Um, Eight thirteen, and it came to pass in the six hundred and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and. Behold, the face of the ground was right. This is from Genesis. The, it's the story of the flood, Noah's Ark. So the first day of the first month is marking when the water dries up. And there's a reference in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 15, 16 through 18. 
Jeremiah 15, 16 through 18, where the experience of the Millerites is presented, has already been addressed here by Brother Jeff, and it reads, Thy words were found, and I will eat them. That's the eating of the little book by the Millerites. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name. So he's telling us of this history, the little book coming down, divinity and humanity combined. Now they receive the name of God, a new name. Verse 17, I sat not in the assembly of the mockers. So this is pointing us to a separation. I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoice. I sat alone because of thy end. For thou hast filled me with indignation. This is pointing to the separation that took place between the Protestants, which became the mockers. They had to sit alone because of the hand of God that was covering any state that produced the first disappointment. Why is my pain perpetual? And my wound incurable, which refuses to be healed, will thou, will thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as waters that fail? He's describing the experience of the first disappointment when they felt as if God had lied to them, or as waters that fail. And we are we are told in Habakkuk chapter two that. This division was to be written upon tables that he may run that read of it, and though it tarry, wait for it, it, uh, it, will, it will not lie, it says. And so this is pointing definitively to that history when the waters fail or the waters dry out. And Exodus 17:7. 7, it's another reference. The references in the Bible with, with water dries out. You can you can light them up on the first day of the first month of it. And it says, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So he's taking us to Massa and Meribah. And Massa and Meribah, Massa means a testing uh, or trial, temptation, trial. It is a test. And Meribah means quarrel, controversy. So it's pointing to the controversy and the quarrel that started at this point with the, the mockers. And um, in that history, and <coughs> In our history, this is where the water is drying up. This is where we need to start asking rain in the time of the latter rain. <coughs> we need to recognize we are at that time, so we need to be asking for that rain. And God is going to sprinkle and He's going to give us that, that water. But this is what is marking the controversy and the test. The test that we are to go through, which has to do with a shaking or a controversy that we need to identify. Is it on the first and the first one? Yes. Yeah, um, well, what, no. What we're saying is that any references where waters are drying up, we are lining up with the first day of the first month. Yes. It's, and we can go also to Numbers 20. Uh, Numbers 20, verses 1 through 3. Uh, Numbers 20, verses 1 through 3. Uh, it says, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. It just says on the first month. And the people abode in Kaddish, or tarried in Kaddish, and Miriam died there, and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered together 
themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, With God that we have died when our brethren died before the Lord. So this incident taking place on the first month and where the waters dry up is identifying the death of Miriam. Yeah. So Miriam is going to die in this history. Um, so in this history, well, this is symbolizing debate, controversy, uh, test. And uh, the death of Miriam at that point was the Protestant churches. Uh, and at the end of the world, it's marking in 9-11, this is when the debate begins, the debate over the latter rain. Not only in Adventism in general, they have been debating this latter rain message, but more specifically within present truth. The controversy that is going on between the true midnight cry, like the message, and the fanatics, the Watertown fanatics. Uh, so it's marking the debate and the, the test. And also, we are marking the death of Miriam. And I think we need to read this quote in your notes, page 138, from Science of the Times, September the 30th, 1880. Sister White tells us, After 40 years wandering in the wilderness, the children of Israel encamped at Kadesh in the desert of Zin, and Miriam died, and was buried there. The living stream which flowed from the smitten rock in Horeb had followed them in all their yearnings, but just before the Hebrew host reached Kadesh, the Lord caused the waters to cease, or to dry up. It was His purpose again to test His people. He would prove them whether they will humbly trust in His providence or imitate their fathers from the people. So we have an incident there marking the drying up of the waters, connecting it with the death of Miriam. Um, we come to, so we are saying the church structure is being passed by, right there, 9-11, Seventh-day Adventist church structure. Um, we come to, next reference, Exodus 42, and this is connected with the setting up of the sanctuary. Uh, It says, uh, verses, Exodus 40, verses 1 and 2. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And verses 16 and 17, Thus did Moses according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. And it came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up, or set up. So, that's marking in this history that God was now raising the uh, Adventist Middle Rights Temple Movement. And in this history, in 9-11, he is raising up his temple in, that is uh, built upon the foundation, the true foundation, and symbolized by these old hats. And uh, it's also symbolizing that God's people is representing the, that each and every one of us is the temple where God wants to dwell and manifest through and this temple is being setting up it has been building in, in, in the process of building it is being set up and now as we proceed we will see that that sanctuary or that temple has to be cleansed 
It's being set up so that it can be cleansed or purified. Associated with that, we have um, the descending of the cloud, and this we will just briefly touch it in, in the verse um, 33 through 38, talks about, well, let's read 33 and 34. It says, And he re reared up the cord round about the tabernacle and the altar, and set up the hanging of the court gate, so Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation, because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So the cloud also descends on the first day of the first month when the temple is being set up. And if you jump to Numbers 15, you have the account, same account, and just a little bit more detail. It has already been read by Brother Mark, I believe. Numbers 9:15 through 23. Um, it says, Numbers 9:15, and on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, that will be 9:11 in our time period, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony. And at even, there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. So it was, the cloud covered it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken out from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed. And in the place where the cloud awoke, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. So this is telling us that God educated His people. They were just following the cloud. When the cloud tarried, they were to do the same, to stay in their tents. And when the cloud moved, they were to follow. And this is equated to the commandment of the Lord. That's how it is expressed in these verses. And when the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and urinated not. And continues to, to elaborate on that in the following verses. So, this cloud that descends on 9 11 is, uh, this has the purpose to signalize the tarrying time. It is time to tarry in our tents there in Jerusalem until the cloud moves and this is the commandment of the Lord for us the next reference we found in 2nd Chronicles 29 17-18 through Second Chronicles 29 verses 17 and 18 it says, Second Chronicles twenty nine, seventeen, and eighteen. Now they begun. Okay, for context, we can read from verse twelve. I think we can read. It says, Then the Levites, verse 12, Then the Levites arose, met Mehat, the sons of Amasai. It's going to give a list of names of Levites. And it says, and this uh, verse 15, And they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves, and came according to the commandment of the king by the word of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. So there's a gathering of Levites with the purpose of sanctifying themselves and cleansing the temple. And the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it, and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it, and carry out a rock into the brook of Kidron. 
Now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify. And on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. So these verses are telling that this is a progressive cleansing process. But if you notice, they're going to purify the temple, but they do it in two stages. And they, it takes eight days first to clean the house, and then eight days to clean the court, right, of the temple. So it's, I still don't understand the meaning of this eight, number eight, but we can see it in this um, history. Find if they equate to the 16th day of the first month, which is the first group offering. Okay, that's it. So, this is the first day of the first month. Eight days will take you to the eighth day of the first month. 16th day of the first month, well, this is when in the feast, of, in, the, in the feasts, on the that's when the first group was offered in the sanctuary, right? This the this is this was fulfilled when Christ was risen from the tomb, and then he ascended to heaven, and he as the first fruits, and then he took with him also a, a group of uh, people he raised from the tomb. So it's a first group offering that is being offered here uh, after the end of this. So, does that typify then these first group offerings? That is, if Christ is the first group, those that were resurrected with him are the first group together. So Christ is the high priest. The priest did the first part of the cleansing in the first eight days. Uh -huh. The this others the that priest. were resurrected are the Levites, the court guard. Mm -hmm. And Passover was on the 14th day of the first month, the yes. uh, bread, 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 bread was the 15th. the 15th day, and the first group offering was on the 16th day, so you've got both the 16 days and the three days in there, the development okay. of the first group offering at least 144,000 Okay, so it's, it's re no, yes, it's referring to the development of the first group offerings in those two stages. We now come to our next reference. Yes. And we have only one more reference for the first day of the first month to cover, and then one more for the first day of the fifth month. So we go to Ezekiel 45 and uh, verses 18 through 21. Ezekiel 45, 18 through 21. And it says, <clears throat> Thus said the Lord God, In the first month, in the first day of the month, thou shalt take a young bullock without blemish, and cleanse the sanctuary. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering, and put it upon the post of the house, and upon the four corners of the cell of the altar, and upon the post of the gate of the inner court, and so thou shalt do the seventh month, seventh day of the month for every one that heareth, and for him that is sinful, so shall he reconcile the house. In the first month, in the fourteenth day of the month, ye shall have Passover, a feast of seven days, and leavened bread shall be eaten. I suppose this is pointing to the same same history that has already been described. And, uh, so it's just representing that this is a cleansing that takes place in advance of a holy convocation. So we know that this cleansing process, which is in two stages, first with the wise virgins, and then with for the 12 disciples and the 70 disciples, and uh, leading up to this sacred convocation of the perfect fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. And this is when the Day of the Lord also commences. So this is a cleansing that takes place in advance of a holy convocation. And we come to the last reference 
in our study. It's found in uh, numbers 30. This is now dealing with the first day of the fifth month. Because this is uh, now just the only reference to the first day of the fifth month in, in the Bible. And it's found in. <coughs> Numbers 33, 38. And it says, And Aaron the priest went up into the Mount Hor at the commandment of the Lord and died there. In the fourth year after the children of Israel came, were come out of the land of Egypt in the first day of the fifth month. So we have the death of Aaron being uh, marked. Aaron dies. And then in Deuteronomy 10, 6 through 8, it's another passage that is going to add information to this. Deuteronomy 10, 6 through 8. And the children of Israel took the journey from Beeroth of the children of Jacan to Mosera. There Aaron died, and there he was buried. And Eliezer, Eliezer, his son, ministered in the priest's office in his stead. So he's being replaced by Eliezer, his son. From thence they journeyed unto Gadgada, and from Gadgada to Jogba, a land of rivers of waters. And that's what I was pointing to you yesterday, that when we were looking into the Exeter camp meeting, August 15, 1844, Exeter meaning waters, or an abundance of waters. This is marking the same, I believe, this verse, when it says that Aaron is going to die here, and he is going to be replaced by Eliezer. And Eliezer, we understand, is it means God's helper. It's pointing out to the role of the Holy Spirit that is, uh, is taking, uh, I assume, I could be wrong, but it seems to me Aaron could be symbolizing here a foolish virgin, and he's being replaced by Eliezer, which is uh, the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the oil that is being received by the wise, and he's going to finish the work in that history, and uh, Eliezer it has been pointed out to us that it is translated as Lazarus in the Greek. In the... So <clears throat> Lazarus is Eliezer, and this is marking in our history when Aaron <coughs> dies to be replaced, replaced by. Eliezer, which is Lazarus, and we already know, we, I don't believe you're going to read all the quotes here, but we understand, well, let's read this one from the Sire of Ages 529, as we are winding up this presentation, it says, in the lane to come to Lazarus, or in Terry, Christ had a purpose of mercy toward those who had not received him. He tarried that by raising Lazarus from the dead, he might give to his stubborn, unbelieving people another evidence that he was indeed the resurrection and the life. And uh, it says, uh, in his mercy, and jumping a few phrases, in, in his mercy he purposed to give them one more evidence that he was the restorer, the one who alone could bring life and immortality to life. This was to be an evidence that the priest could not misinterpret. This was the reason of his delay in going to Bethany. His crowning miracle, the raising of Lazarus, was to set the seal of God on his work and on his claim to divinity. So this raising of Lazarus that in our history is going to take place at the midnight cry, is going to set the seal of God, is going to empower the message for this time, the claims of God are going to be uh, are going to be confirmed because it is here when 
the world is going to be able to see, or the universe is going to be able to see, human beings that have been taken from the last generation, the most corrupt one, and have been emptied of self through this cleansing process, and are going to be in filled with the Holy Spirit, and God is going to be able to manifest the righteousness of Christ through these human vessels. Amen. And they're going to be lifted up in the midst of this crisis, the image of the beast crisis leading up to the something law, where the whole universe is going to be able to recall this wonder. It's the, the mystery of godliness. God in, incarnate in flesh. And it is my prayer that every one of us may uh, be partakers of that experience, that as we continue to eat the little book, that we may receive the oil, that our vessels may be cleansed and purified as we rely on God's promises to put uh, sin away in our lives. And that we may claim those promises where He has told us that if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, He's going to fill us. He's going to uh, he's going to provide that oil that we need in our land. That we may be resurrected at the midnight cry and be part of that procession that is going to uh, lighten the earth for the bright moon. It is my prayer that every one of us may be partaker of that experience. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, uh, as the lion on the tribe of Judah continues to unfold these truths, we are trying, striving to comprehend the significance of this way mark that you have opened from the story of Ezra. And how these two way marks, first day of the first month, first day of the fifth month, they describe the time period that we live in. And they describe a period when you are tearing with us, if we will tarry with you, that you may prepare us, that you may teach us, that you may fill us with the, the you will give us the oil, your promise to give us the oil in double measure if we tarry until the midnight cry. And, and if we are faithful to you, to your word. We pray that that may be our experience, that when the midnight cry comes, and we know and understand now that this is going to be, for us, the end of our probation, we pray that we may be found among the wise virgins, each and every one of us, with oil in our vessels. This is our prayer. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.